Good morning, everyone. Mate, that was the most lethargic response I've had in a long time. Good morning, everyone. Ah, good to know that you're awake. Because <laughs> if you're asleep already, well then, heck, in half an hour's time, you'll be really in a deep sleep. So I'm glad that you're at least awake for now. Welcome to those who've made it here today. And of course, with our limited seating capacity, it does mean we have to have some people over in the hall for the live stream. So welcome to them. Welcome to those who are tuning in from home as well. But I'm glad that you're here today. And I hope that you have an open heart to get a message from God that will hopefully have an impact on your life. I've entitled my sermon today, The Passionate Pursuit. Now, that could, I guess, conjure up a few different uh, ideas, but you'll come to see what I'm talking about as we uh, explore this this morning. You know, as I was growing up as a young lad, I was a passionate enthusiast of motorsport. And of course, when I was a kid, there was no such thing as V8 supercars. It was touring cars. And uh, for those of you who are my age or older, you'll be familiar with a certain sporting rivalry that was quite famous at the time between Queenslander Dick Johnson and Peter Brock. And of course, just seeing those Group C touring cars will bring back a flood of memories to those of you who were uh, living through the 80s. Now, of course, it's one thing to know uh, and see these people on TV. It's another thing to actually see them in person. And when I was a young lad, I went down to Sydney and went to Amaru Park. And for those of you, Amaru Park is a housing estate now, it's long gone. But Amaru Park was one of the better circuits to actually go and watch motor racing because it was kind of like in an amphitheatre, a natural kind of bowl. So if you got up on the hill, you could see most of the track from that one spot. Whereas other tracks like Bathurst, you kind of watch one corner and that's about all you can see. But as I was growing up, and the other, the other plus about Emeru Park is it was a pretty limited sporting facility, so they didn't even have a formal pit area, so all the crews had to be up in a car park up on the top of the other hill. But the advantage of that was you didn't have to buy or pay extra for a pit pass, so you could actually mingle amongst where all the uh, pit crews were, and if you were lucky enough, you would get to spy a driver. Now, although I was actually a Dick Johnson fan myself, I did get to meet Peter Brock. And I guess what really stood out to me about meeting Peter Brock was the fact that here I was, some little, I don't even know how old I was, but probably 12 years old, not much more. And Peter Brock actually engaged in a conversation with me like I was an important adult. And I never forget that for the rest of my life. So even though I wasn't actually a Brock fan, I had to uh, give the guy some credit for being uh, you know, a pretty decent sort of a chap. So even though he drove the wrong car, uh, he seemed likeable, charismatic, and seemingly a decent bloke. But the question I want to challenge you with today is how well did I really know Peter Brock? Now, I'd met him, so obviously I knew him better than somebody who's never met him and only seen him on TV. But of course, those who knew him a lot better than I knew him have a, a much better idea of what he was really like as a person. And of course, Peter Brock had a nickname. Who can tell me? Perfect. Peter Perfect. That was his nickname. And he seemed to have a pretty clean image as an icon of Australian motorsport at the time, but later on it kind of emerged that Peter wasn't so perfect in other ways when it came to his personal life. One of Peter Brock's co-drivers, uh, Thomas Mazira, who some of you may be familiar with. And of course, Peter Brock is most famous for winning the most number of Bathursts of any other driver. But Thomas Mazira, uh, that's him on the right, or yes, you're right there. Thomas Mazira co drive with Peter Brock, and he said that in his view, Jim Richards was actually a better driver than Peter Brock. But he said, I think Brock just had a much better PR department. He goes on to share a rather humorous incident where Thomas Mazira was co-driving and he said that Peter Brock came in six laps earlier than he was scheduled for his pit stop. And when Thomas Mazira rushed to get ready at the last minute, finally got in the car and he said that every warning light on the car was basically on and that the car stank of burnt oil. And of course, it didn't go much longer from there. But he said when he watched the telecast later on, Brock jumps out of the car, says to the first TV crew he can see, Yep, the car is running well, it's fantastic, we've got a good chance now, Thomas just needs to bring it home. 
but uh, obviously Thomas had a slightly different perspective on that with uh, all the warning lights and so on. And of course, it didn't make uh, Thomas look so good when the car died after his uh, taking over. Of course, the partner of uh, Peter Brock, Beverly Brock, as she's known, even though she took the Brock name, they were technically never married, um, but she had that name as uh, legally. But she said that while motoring journalists who knew him well may have airbrushed over part of Brock's life, Bev says she knew that he was not faithful to her. In fact, she said, when the situation arose, he would sometimes be tempted. I had entered the relationship with my eyes open, and I had to take the good with the bad. So she was a pretty understanding woman, you might say. Close friend and journalist of uh, Brock, Paul Gover, who was described by Bev as one of the few people who really got to know the real Peter Brock, said of the man, Peter Brock was a great friend and a role model to a generation, but he was not perfect, far from it in some ways. So there's a big difference between knowing about someone and knowing someone in the sense of knowing them warts and all. And I guess one of the interesting things about marriage is that when you enter into a relationship and you live with someone, you get to know the good and the bad. And obviously when it comes to relationships and you look at the divorce rate, that suggests that this can be a challenge when you get to know someone for their strengths as well as their weaknesses. But it's not just an issue of when it comes to knowing people in the relationships that we have on this earth. It's also an issue when it comes to knowing God. Because the question is, how well do you really know God? And by that, when I ask that question, I mean, how well do you know God in a personal sense, as opposed to things you've heard other people say about God? And of course, you can read the Bible and you learn about God. But there's this relationship and connection as you go through life that has a true impact in terms of how much of your encounter with God is a personal encounter. And the question that follows from this is how much do you trust God? Because if you're going to trust someone, you obviously need to know them and know them well enough that they're trustworthy. Because it's only, as you, it's only as you live with someone that you come to know whether it's safe to trust them or not. And so in a sense with God, as you go through life with God, you're learning every day, is God as trustworthy as people say? Or could I go out on a limb here and end up embarrassed? Now, there are some people that, I met, that I've met and I really like them as people. But I wouldn't choose to go into business with them. And of course... People have different strengths and different qualities. And as I said, it's only as you get to really know them that you have a sense of that kind of relationship and where you trust them in different ways or not. A very interesting passage is found in Matthew chapter 7. And this is what Jesus said, coming in at the end of the Sermon of the Mount. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I'll tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Now, I don't know about you, but I find this a pretty confronting kind of Bible verse because it seems to suggest that even, you know, seemingly good religious people can, I mean, they're even doing things for God. They have a ministry um, can actually be told by God, I don't even know who you are. I don't know if that alarms you. It alarms me. I think it should alarm you. But Jesus refers here not so much to an intellectual knowledge, but more about a relational knowledge. And it's only as you do life with someone that you come to understand them in a relationship context. Of course, looking at this passage at the context, it comes from the end of the Sermon of the Mount. And it seems to be a final warning in terms of Jesus defining what true faith is all about. And of course, there is warnings that Jesus shared in this sermon that there is a risk of people coming in a wolves in sheep's clothing, so they look like they're the real deal, but in actual fact, they may have another agenda. And of course, they can not only say all the right things about God, but if you look at this passage, it even says that they were able to drive out demons and perform miracles. So we're not just talking like an average preacher here. We're talking someone who seems to be manifesting the signs of a pretty close connection with God 
to the extent that they're able to perform miracles. But of course, it's interesting that Jesus can say here that even though they were able to do these things, when it comes to the judgment day, he could say, I don't even know you. So it's not a verbal claim to follow Jesus that really means much according to what Jesus is saying here. So you can't be saved by just being a nominal Christian, you know, someone who rocks up to church occasionally, sort of, you know, I grew up a Seventh-day Adventist or I, I have my name on a church roll somewhere. That's not a free ticket to heaven like some people seem to think of it is. But according to this verse, it seems that a person can seem like a Christian in the eyes of other people but be defined by Jesus as an evildoer, even though they look like, they're, uh, look like they're a good Christian. Only those who do the Father's will and are known to the Father will enter the kingdom of heaven, it says there. So when Jesus said, I never knew you, that would, like, that's a pretty harsh kind of a rebuke, isn't it? Imagine rocking up to heaven yourself and Jesus is going, oh, don't know that guy, Psh, not away with that person. But what he meant was he never recognized them as his true disciples or as his friends. He never had anything in common with them nor approved of them. Christ did not dwell in their hearts and nor did they have his mind. In all these ways and more, Jesus never knew them. Not that Jesus is not breaking off the relationship here because there never actually was a relationship in the first place to be able to break off. Despite their high-sounding words and their showy displays of religious fervor, there was no intimacy, there was no connection in terms of a day-to-day relationship with Jesus. And it's it's for that reason that he said, I don't know who they are. Of course, the uh, interesting thing we find in John chapter 16 is that Jesus said, I have told you these things so that you won't abandon your faith, for you'll be expelled from the synagogues at the time, and the time is coming when those who kill you will think they are doing a holy service for God. Now, this is a similar kind of passage, but coming from a different angle. But again, this should, I think, alarm us a little bit. Because here we have people who are faithfully believing they are living out the service, the holy service of God, and they're actually killing the genuine followers of Jesus. So how can somebody who's seemingly close to God actually go about killing the followers of Christ. It's really quite confronting. And yet, how could they be off track and yet seemingly be oblivious to it and not know? Interestingly, when you look at the next verse here, and it's at the bottom there, it says, This is because they have never known the Father or me. So this verse highlights that the only real safeguard we have in this world is whether or not you know Jesus or the Father. Now, of course, there are some Adventists that are very good at coming up with timelines of last day events. But, you know, all of that knowledge is not going to do you any good when it comes to the crunch. If you want to be ready for the climax of Earth's history, you need to be in a relationship. And you need to be in a relationship where you're building a foundation now so that when when things get really tense and difficult, you have a strength of relationship that will put you in a safe place. Nothing else will uh, achieve that for you other than knowing God and knowing Jesus. And of course, Jesus coming here on this earth was an important way of us coming to know what God was all about. In fact, the way to knowing God, the Father, is obviously through knowing Jesus. But we have to be aware as Christians because there is a trap we can fall into. And this trap is knowing about God, knowing your Bible well. You know, the Pharisees knew their Bible well. Pharisees would have made great Adventists today. They'd be the pillars of the church because they took holiness seriously. I mean, the Pharisees have a bad rap because of what Jesus said about, about them. But if you were living at the time of the Pharisees, you would have thought these were, these were very religious people. They were very sincere. But Jesus said they missed the point. They were, they were very much valued the importance of being knowledgeable in their Bible. But Jesus said, although they read the Scriptures... They didn't actually see Jesus when they read them. So it's a warning to us today that we need to not just read the Bible, we don't have not just have doctrinal theological knowledge, we need to read the Bible as a means to getting to know Jesus so that we can live with Jesus. And getting to know Jesus isn't just about reading the Bible. It's about bringing Jesus into your day-to-day living and basically 
doing life with Jesus. It's like a partnership where you're not just living for yourself, but you're living in a partnership with Christ. So as you go through your day and you encounter challenges and problems, who do you go to? Your partner and let them know what the challenge is and how you're going to get, how you're going to get through that. A few years ago, my wife organized a holiday to Europe and I was happy for her to organize this holiday. All I would do is show up. But I did have two requests. And that was one, to visit the Lamborghini factory, and two, to visit the Ferrari factory. Now, if you ever get in Europe, I recommend the Lamborghini factory because that was hands-on and you could go in there and got a great tour and you could see where all the stuff was being made. And Lamborghinis are all, no, I didn't, Urus maybe not so much, but the uh, Huracan and the uh, Aventador are totally handmade. No robots in there. So that was an impressive sight. Ferrari factory tour, you can't really get a proper tour because unless you go and buy a Ferrari, then they might let you in the factory. But for the tourists like myself, the Ferrari factory tour is sitting in a bus driving past buildings. That's where the engines are made. That's where the, this, you can't even see in there. So that was a bit of a disappointment. But what was interesting when I got to uh, look at the uh, Ferrari museum is a lot of nice looking cars. Now, of course, my tastes in cars are a little more humble than Ferraris and Lamborghinis. But I've read about them. I can admire them, you know, a nice-looking car. And I knew some facts about a Ferrari 458. Designed by Pininfarina, powered by a 4.5-litre V8, 400 kilowatts of power at 9,000 RPM. Of course, this is two models out of date now, but at the time, this was the latest and greatest. Seven-speed dual-clutch gearbox, top speed 340, zero to 100 in 2.9 seconds, which, you know, for a road car, anything under six is pretty quick. And in Australia, 550000 was what a Ferrari 458 would have cost you at the time. Now, as I was walking up to the Ferrari Museum, I noticed a number of places where you could test drive a Ferrari. Now, depending on the size of your budget, you can test drive a 10-minute ride in a Ferrari, or you can take an hour drive, or you can take a whole day drive, or if you've got deep enough pockets, you can drive a Ferrari on a racetrack. So I was quite taken by this. It wasn't something that I'd budgeted for in our holiday. Now, for some reason, my clickers just stopped working there. Just, yep, thanks. Um, I thought, yeah, I hadn't actually thought of driving a Ferrari, but... Um, Looking at the prices, the 10-minute uh, drive was affordable. Now, of course, there's the poor man's Ferrari, which is the California back at this time, which is a four-seater, front-engine V8. But I really thought, you know what, a 458, rear-engine, more of a powerhouse Ferrari, that's something I would be more interested in. Now, I found this place that was sort of away from where the more popular places were, so I thought, I'm going to try my negotiation skills can I get the 458 for the price of the California? You know, 10 minutes here, you know, it's 10 minutes of my life, but if you can save a few dollars, it's worth trying. So they met me in the middle, a sort of a compromise. So I thought, well, that's fair enough. Now, my wife put me under strict instructions. Now, don't push the limits, you know, just do what they say, follow their instructions. So because I'm a very law-abiding citizen when it comes to road rules, I kept that in the back of my mind. So it would be one thing to know about a Ferrari, but it would be another thing to actually experience it. So did I get to experience it? Yes, I did. So here is the highlights of my Ferrari drive. We need some sound. Now, so much for my wife's warning, 
I backed off at about 130 odd there, and he's like, go, go, go. <laughs> so, you know, I do what I'm told, so I went. <laughs> but I was a bit uh, bummed at the missed opportunity that I could have kept the pedal to the metal the whole time, and uh, yeah, it would have been, even been more fun. Now, I don't know if Italian police just stay away from that section of road, because um, that is a 70 zone through there, but uh, it's... Uh, <laughs> No, uh, you could have a field day. If that was in Australia, mate, it would never happen. But can I, see, can I describe an experience differently of knowing about a Ferrari versus having driven a Ferrari? There's obviously a huge difference. And when it comes to living the Christian life, there's knowing about God, there's knowing about the Bible, and there's actually living it in a sense of knowing it and experiencing it. Of course, when it comes to knowing Christ, Paul's life was transformed. And don't mistake the fact that Paul wasn't a zealous Christian. Certainly, I mean, sorry, not a zealous Christian, but a zealous God follower before he became a Christian. Paul had a passion for following God. And it's clear when you look at Philippians chapter 3, Paul was sincere and dedicated. He says, I was circumcised when I was eight days old. So like any good Jew, I'm a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew if ever there was one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demand the strictest, the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, I obeyed, obeyed the law without fault. Now, of course, as I said, the problem is because the Pharisees get a bit of a bad rap in the Bible, we kind of dismiss that. But, you know, at the time, he was the, the Christian. So to help you understand what I mean by this, Perhaps if uh, Paul grew up a Seventh-day Adventist, I could, tr I could translate this passage to help you better understand what Paul is saying there. So if Paul had grown up in Australia as a Seventh-day Adventist, he might say in verse 5, I was born in Kurunbong. I'm a fifth-generation Adventist. I'm related to Ellen White. I'm the son of a very successful and prominent evangelist. I was an elder in my church for 25 years, always trying my hardest to avoid sin of any kind. I was so zealous that I not only gave up meat, but I even became a vegan. As for righteousness, I was as good as a human can be. But I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared to the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus as my Lord. But what does it really mean to know Christ, to experience Christ? I read Herb Larson's book. Many of you would probably be familiar with Herb Larson. He's spoken at Queensland Big Camps a number of times in different tents. But it's interesting when you read his own book, he describes his journey of growing up as an Adventist. And he says, early on in the book, he says, how I wanted to experience the abundant life that the Bible talked about so unsparingly. Most of the people I knew up as, as most of the people I knew as supposed good Christians were long-faced, critical, and judgmental, and they seemed to be living boring and empty lives. He then uh, got to a point in his life where he decided to get baptized, and he says, now that I was baptized, a baptized Christian, I thought, now that I was a baptized Christian, at least, that's what I thought I was, I began a life of waiting for the supposed benefits of Christianity to kick in and overwhelm me with the abundant life always talked about but so rarely seen. And of course, as he went on as living the Christian life, he was quite successful in a number of ways in a worldly material sense. And he mixed with celebrities, and I guess you could say that from a secular perspective, he'd arrived in life, and Herb Larson was a success. But he said that as much as he had worldly success, he had none of the contentment and peace of mind that he was seeking and that he believed would come from living the Christian faith. So he dedicated himself to ministry and was actually involved in a church plant and was, uh, I guess, successfully leading out as a minister in that uh, church plant. But he says, even as part of a highly successful church plant, he was still missing something. He describes it like this. He says, I was nothing but a fraud. I was preaching about the benefits of a relationship with Jesus and watching as it worked in other people's lives. But in that department, I was perpetually running flat out on empty. 
So I've got to admire his, you know, honesty here. He's pretty much laying it out in his book how it was. And of course, those of you who are familiar with his story, you'll remember that he got to such a point of frustration that he made a deal with God that he would get up at 5.30 every morning and read his Bible for an hour. So one hour every morning, he would pray his guts out and read scripture, as he says, in search of the answer to his spiritual frustration. As you read the book, he says, nothing seemed to come even after 30 days. And so frustration began to build. After 45 days, things got even worse, and he felt like God was withdrawing, leaving him feeling even emptier and emptier than what he had at the beginning. He says that this feeling of abandonment would sometimes keep him awake at night with thoughts of disillusionment churning and burning him up. In fact, he would cry out, If you are real God, then why can't I experience you? And then when no answer seemed to come, he would begin to entertain the chilling conclusion that maybe, maybe everything he'd ever taught and believed in regarding God was actually nothing more than a lie or a cruel myth. After 60 days of nothing, Herb laid down on the floor, clenched his fists and began to vent his pent-up frustration with God for his lack of response, not only for the 60 days, but for the years of yearning that he'd felt before that time. He was about to ride off 38 years of his life as a Christian, a life that had, been, that had at times experienced some elements of God, but never seemed to produce a dividend. After venting, he saw his Bible, and after resisting for some time, reluctantly decided he would have one last try. He read it, and to his surprise, as he was reading the Bible after this time of pouring out his heart in frustration to God, every word seemed to suddenly go straight to his heart. Without warning, he says, he exploded in tears. The experience he could only describe was as that of a supernatural encounter. But then after that, he wondered, is that just a one-off? But it wasn't. But then the question started arising in his mind. Why had it taken so long? Why had he been through such a valley of, of time where things didn't seem to come together? And so he wrestled with these questions. But as he wrestled with God, he did find some answers. He says he came to the realization that it is one thing to know about someone. It's entirely another to know that, individually, that individual personally. He says he could discuss Bible-related issues and could debate theology with the best of them. But all of this did nothing for him in terms of true spirituality. By their fruits you all shall know them. And Herb felt comfortably normal or average compared to his fellow church members. But Jesus promised that we can bear much fruit. And because of that promise, we find that in uh, John chapter 15... But not only that, we also find as we read through the book of Acts that there is a promise of amazing things that can be done by Christians who know God. Supernatural things are described in the book of Acts as though they're an ordinary, everyday experience. So there are two distinct standards by which we can judge ourselves as Christians. We can compare ourselves to those around us to think if we're right with God and, yeah, you know, compared to the average Adventist, you know, I kind of shape up okay. Or we can compare ourselves to the example of Jesus Christ. Now, obviously, we're never going to be perfect like Jesus Christ. But we see figures in the Bible, imperfect figures of the people in the Bible, like Paul. But you notice, Paul knew Jesus. And you don't just have to read Philippians 3 to know that Paul knew Jesus. And as you read a number of characters in the Bible, it wasn't just a sort of a bunch of quotes that they could spit out at you. There was a knowledge that grew out of a relationship there, that they'd experienced and encountered God for themselves. And that's what enabled them to be able to speak about God in such a way. So depending on which standard we compare ourselves, other Christians or the example of Jesus, we can either contentedly sit back and enjoy the earthly ride, or we sit up and take notice and get proactive about attempting to understand that we have a problem and try to determine something that we can do to make a difference. Now, the Bible encourages us to seek, and you will find. But it sometimes doesn't seem to work. Have you ever tried seeking after God, seeking a deeper relationship, a more intimate connection, but it, it doesn't seem to last, or it doesn't seem to, 
to go the distance. Maybe you have a spiritual high at big camp or summer camp where you feel that, but then it kind of wanes after time. What does it mean to seek God like that? Of course, one of the challenges as a Christian is sometimes we have the perspective of, you know, what's the minimum amount of effort I can invest in a relationship with God and, you know, still be a Christian? Is going to, is going to church enough? I mean, is that really the best perspective to have as a Christian? I mean, imagine in the earthly sense in terms of marriage, you know, imagine if my, my motto in marriage, and um, unlike Vim, I would say don't rush out to have kids, just as a little aside, but, you know, ask a lot of people, get different perspectives, depends on the age you're at, but um, glad for Vim, he loves his kids so much, I'm happy to wait, but anyway, what does it mean to seek after God? Well, if you look at that in a, marital, in a marriage context, you imagine if you came into a marriage with, what's the least amount of effort I can put into this relationship and my wife will still put up with me? Now, of course, you laugh at that, but when you start out in a relationship, you're highly motivated to do wonderful things to make your spouse or your partner or your girlfriend or your boyfriend feel positive because you're motivated in the relationship. But there's a danger in all relationships that over time that enthusiasm and that eagerness to uh, show love to your partner can wane. And it's the same with the relationship with God. There's a reason why one of the churches in Revelation is said or told or encouraged or hit with the fact that they've lost their first love because as Christians, we can settle into a a sort of a, a kind of a, well, a comfortable place, shall I say, where it feels okay. In fact, I was even tempted to call my sermon today passionately pursuing God with determined half-heartedness because sometimes if we're honest, you know, when it comes to our relationship with God, over time, you know, it's, it's not as energetic as perhaps we would like. Of course, one of the challenges with living the Christian life is we find that it's hard. It's, you know, if you try to be a better person, it's, it's not as easy as it sounds, you know. I've often made the resolution, you know, I'm going to try to go to bed at 9 o'clock. You know, you know, it's a challenge because I'm often out in the evenings. But even when I am home, it's still hard to get to bed at 9 o'clock because there's so many distractions and, you know, don't feel like it, whatever it might be. And so it's the same thing when it comes to doing anything good. You try it for a while, but then it just seems like hard work and you kind of give up. Notice when the Bible says to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, not... You know, if you, have to, if you have some time for God, you know, after you're busy with your work and your family and all those other things, if you can squeeze God in at the end a little bit, that'd be good. But of course, it's so easy for that to be our custom and to be our, our way it works out. But seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness is not second or third or at the end of the list. How often do we squeeze a little bit of God into the rest of our busy lives? And it's a challenge for all of us, I'm sure. Herb Larson describes the analogy of the difference between a prospector and a miner. A prospector is somebody who, you know, when they've got a bit of time, when they're on holidays, they might have a, one of those metal detectors and they go for a little bit of gold here and there, but it's a small part of their overall life. Whereas someone who works as a miner, mining is something that is a big part of their life because, A, their livelihood depends on their success, but also there's that constant drive and that desire to find treasure. You know, Jesus told of a, a parable along those lines that the kingdom of God is like somebody who's looking for a treasure. And the treasure was so valuable and so good and would benefit their lives in such a way that they were willing to give up everything so that they could find that treasure. A prospector or a miner. Someone who knows about God or someone who knows God. Someone who knows about cars or someone who's driven a car. Someone who knows about a celebrity versus somebody who's living with and has met a celebrity and knows them well. The challenge for us living today is that we have to admit when we look at the Western world, Christianity does not seem to be thriving. Where is the fruit? Where is the much fruit that Jesus promised? And it's important to recognize at this point, it's not about hard work. It's not about working harder. If Christians could be good through hard work, then a lot of legalistic people would be great Christians. But just like Paul wasn't a great 
follower of God by working hard as a Jew. We can't be a great Christian by working hard at it ourselves. In fact, in some ways, we have to do the opposite to working hard. And the opposite of working hard is called surrender. And it seems like such a simple thing to do, but it's actually not so simple. Because surrendering means giving up. It means giving up our agenda. It means giving up our desires at times. It means giving up what we want to do. And I don't know about you, but I know what I want to do. And I don't like being told what to do by others. But of course, if we want to have that intimate connection with Jesus, then the Bible is pretty clear that it starts by building a relationship on a foundation of surrender. It's only that we can give up, it's only as we give up that we can get when it comes to a relationship with God. But to surrender, you need to trust. First, you need to know that if you put all your faith and trust in God, that he's going to look after that trust and he's not going to make you do something really scary. Although, then again, he might. But once you know God well enough and there's that relationship of trust, you come to a point in your life where even when God asks you to do something you're not so keen on, you think, well, I'm kind of a bit nervous about this, but I have experienced God enough to know that he's not going to lead me down a dead-end road. He's not going to take me to a place that's bad for me unless there's some benefit in the long run. Of course, it's freeing when you actually surrender your life because it doesn't mean that you've constantly got to be in control of everything. Of course, if you're in the safe hands of a partnership connection with God, you don't have to worry so much about life because anything that happens in your life, it's not new to God. It's not unexpected. God knows it was going to come before it even happened. And so in that sense, while there's a fear of letting go, there's a lot of reassurance and a peace that comes from trusting your life and putting it in God's safe hands to protect you. Over time, you come to the humbling realization that God is doing things in your life that you couldn't do in and of yourself. And that's what makes God real in your life. When you see God making a change in your life, you know, the mark of a true Christian is not about how much Bible knowledge you know or what you know about the different facts and information. The true indication of your knowledge with God is the extent that God and the Holy Spirit is producing fruit in your life. If you want to know if you're growing as a Christian, the simple measure is, are you changing? Are you being more loving as a spouse? Are you being more loving as a parent? These are the true markers, becoming more like Christ. But there are no shortcuts to a dynamic results-producing relationship with Christ. Interestingly, when you look at John 10, Jesus says, I told you the truth. Anyone who sneaks over the wall of a sheepfold, rather than going through the gate, must surely be a thief and a robber. But the one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep recognize his voice and come to him. Now, this is an interesting analogy because the assumption would be coming out of this that we also are in a position to know God's voice. And the more and the closer connection you have with Christ, the more able you are to discern if that's just some random wild thought that I had or if that is an idea that God has put in your head or a prompting of what God might want you to do. And so it's important to remember that, as Jesus said here, that my sheep will recognize my voice. The goal of our relationship and our connection with Jesus is so that we can also come to a point where we know and recognize his voice. Verse 10, the last line there, says, The thief's purpose is to steal, to kill and destroy, but my purpose is to give them a rich and a satisfying life. And of course, all of us want to have a rich and a satisfying life, don't we? Yeah, of course we do. We want to be happy. Everyone in this world wants to be happy. But the question is, how do you find that happiness? Because this world is full of people telling you, hey, if you do this, you'll be happy. If you do that, you'll be happy. But really... What actually creates that happiness? There's plenty of Christians that will tell you what you need to do to experience happiness. But I want to suggest that the key to finding happiness is found in Jesus. And it's only found as we live each day in partnership with Jesus so that we can come to know him. So that we don't just know about Jesus or what other people say about Jesus, but we know what Jesus is like for ourselves. And as we come to know Jesus, we not only hear his voice and we discern it, but we're also in a position where we're able to follow his days or follow him in our lives in such a way that we experience the peace and the comfort that comes 
from living each day in relationship with Christ. I want to encourage you today, when it comes to this week, to start out with a knowledge, a passionate pursuit of knowing Jesus for real, for yourself, not just a second-hand faith.